morning again. You ready to worship? As Jamie was saying, we're excited about what's going to happen here in this church. Are you? You sing along with us. We will sing, sing, sing and make music with the heavens. We will sing, sing, sing. Grateful that you hear 
us when we shout your praise. Lift high the name of Jesus. What's not to love about you? Heaven and earth adore you. Kings and kingdoms bow down. excited about what's going to happen in church today. Give me a hear it. Give me a yay, God. So when we sing this next part, I want to hear you sing, sing, sing. Make music to the heavens. Raise the rafters. Are you with me? Let me hear. Are you with me? Okay. Sing, 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 and make music with the heavens. We will Grateful that you hear us, we shout your praise. Live high the name. We will sing, 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 and make music with the heavens. We will sing, sing, sing. Yay, God! And again, Father, we just, we thank you. We thank you that we can come into your house and sing your praise and be excited about what's going on here and, and, just, and just know that you hear, our, hear our, our cries when we praise you and when we sing the name of your son, Jesus. And we know that no matter what we're going through in our lives, we have so many reasons to praise you anyway whether we're, we're going through heartache, whether we're going through a, a loss, whether we're going through financial difficulties, no matter what, we have so many reasons to still praise you, to still thank you for the breath we breathe, to, to, to just wake up each day. 
And we thank you for that. Amen. Intro, two, three, four. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing. So bless the Lord, oh my soul.
to sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. I worship your holy name. Lord, I worship your holy name. Thank you, thank you that we have so many reasons to praise you. Again, no matter what we're going through in our lives, we can praise you. We can praise you because your love, your grace, your peace is unending. It will never leave us. As you, as you say, you will never leave us or forsake us. And in our hearts sometimes that seems to be so impossible to, to comprehend that we can still sing your praises when it feels like our world is crashing around us. But I pray that this morning you will remind us that we can be excited. We can be excited about what you have done, about what you are doing, and what you are still going to do in the future. For us, as a church, for us personally. And if there's anyone here who, who does it, seem to understand what I'm even talking about. They don't, they don't quite get this, this, this whole thing that we're talking about with Jesus and with having this, this unending love for us. And I pray that this morning they will, they will have a, a deeper understanding, hopefully, of what that means. That's our prayer. That's the prayer of our church, is that anybody who walks in here will, will see Jesus, will see you through us. Because that's why we're here. Amen. You may be seated. Um, if you were here last week, you realize that we were, um, you remember, we're talking about uh, who we are, who are we as a church. Um, last week, we discussed uh, the uh, idea that we were talking about, we are, have been referred to as a church that preaches the feel-good gospel. And our study last week demonstrated uh, something I think that was pretty glaring, um, and that is that the, uh, the gospel is something that should make us feel good. Uh, the good news is good news for a reason, and as we do, as we went through there, and we talked about a lot of different things, and the fact that you know feeling good about the gospel does not mean that you ignore the very serious parts of it, but when it comes down to it, the good news is really, really good, and it should actually affect the way we feel. Um, I mentioned I had a phrase last week about robot hearts, and as a result, my sister-in-law um, actually, thank you. Um, designed a t-shirt, I should have gotten a picture of the t-shirt, she actually had one that said, my robot heart has been changed by Jesus, um, which I thought that was kind of cool, oh yeah, that's sweet, um, <laughs> and uh, she's actually going to, I think she made, designed it, she's going to like you know, make it available or whatever. This week though, we're talking about some other things, and one of the other things that has happened in our church for the last 10 years, a, re a way that has been, we, to which we have been referred partly because we originally met in a movie theater, but also there were other implications we're going to talk about, is that we have been referred to as the Popcorn Church, or the Popcorn Jesus, or the, so many other uh, versions of that. And again, I realize that it, it, the, the purpose of it, and I actually thought it had gone away. This is what's really fun. I thought that once we moved out of the theater, that that would go away. But I've actually had uh, conversations with Donna Christenberry, who is our um, connection coach, and she says that still persists. It's the popcorn church, it's the popcorn Jesus church. And I know what's implied by that. What's implied by that is the same, kind of the same thing that's implied by the feel-good church thing. We don't really have a whole lot of substance. There are people who actually thought we just came and watched movies and ate popcorn um, at our church. Some of you are probably laughing because that's what you thought originally. Um, the... Um, or whatever, but they actually thought that. And honestly, you know, that would be really cool, but that's not what we do, okay? Um, the other implication, though, is that it's just an entertainment thing. We're here to kind of show, you know, just to, to make everybody feel good, make everybody have a good time, and then go out and, and send them out unchanged. Now, I know, as someone who's been here for nine years now, 
and who knows the heart of the people who started the church, and as a vision that was created, that was given to them by God, that has never been the goal. The goal has always been that people will come in and they'll be changed. Yes, relevance is important. Yes, we do things a little bit differently. I mean, we sing songs about partying in church. And you know, that, that word party, I was just sitting, and this is something that just hit me when we were doing, this word, doing that song this morning. That word has been kind of hijacked by popular culture. The idea of partying, when we talk about having a party, so many people get a very negative idea about what it means to party. But do you guys realize that the first, the first miracle Jesus ever did was at a party? We are called to be a celebratory people. And so when people talk about popcorn, and I'm going to ask a question before we get started. Where, well, this is kind of where my brain went with this, kind of with the feel-good gospel thing, and it's the same way. Where do people eat popcorn? Give me some specific examples. Where do people eat popcorn? In a theater, watching a movie. Anything else? Their living room? Ball games? The circus? The fair? Or the fair? Um, the what? They have free popcorn at Rural King. Okay. You guys just completely tanked my sermon. Thanks. That one example completely blew everything I was going to say. You can all go home now. Actually, at the, at, didn't the bank used to have popcorn? OVB, does, they did popcorn too. Um, and okay, popcorn, we actually have a popcorn machine because we decided we were going to, you know, own it if we're going, you know, if we're going to be the popcorn church, we're going to own it. But what we talked about, and one of the things that hit me, because I don't usually eat popcorn at, at farm supply places, um, <laughs> is that in my experience throughout life, the only place that I really eat popcorn is where something special is happening, right? There is, um, uh, there are events, and you know, one of the things, I, I was at Gallia Academy High School this week, and popcorn is the only food that's actually allowed into the gym when the games are going on. I was kind of surprised by that. I, was, I mean, it's, I know why, but it was interesting because it kind of went, a really, it went along with what we were talking about. But, you know, when I go to football games, when I go to baseball games, um, particularly baseball games, but you go to a circus, you go to a movie theater, um, you, even at home, when you're going to have you know, a movie at the house. I remember as a kid growing up, before, you know, you could throw popcorn in a microwave and get it within two minutes anytime you wanted it. Popcorn was a special event, and it usually coincided with something that was happening at the house, right? You were having, um, people were coming over, you were watching a movie, there was a, it might be World Series or, or, or Super Bowl or something connected to something special. And so when popcorn is used, utilized, and, and, and traditionally, it's because there's something special happening. It also means that's where people want to be. You know, um, you don't know, there aren't a whole lot of people who, like, sneak popcorn into their car and eat it by themselves. You know, like closet pop, uh, popcorn addicts, you know. There aren't, that doesn't really happen that often. When you eat popcorn, you're usually in a big crowd. That's why it's usually a mess afterwards, because everybody eats popcorn, and you can't eat it neatly. At least I can't. I've never been able to figure out how to do that. The popcorn spills out everywhere, but it's, it's a group of people. It's a shared experience. And, and that's the other part of it. It's a shared experience. You go where there where other people are also eating popcorn, but they're, you're going to you know, do whatever, either at the games or even at the movie theaters. You eat popcorn. There are other people eating there. And there have been a lot of people who have thought that when DVDs came out and home theaters came out and all that kind of stuff happened, that people were going to just stop going to the movies. But one of the things that they've discovered is the shared experience of being together watching a movie is, in a, is, is something that you can't replace at home with an awesome system. But the reality is, even all those things, um, they're not for everybody. You know, some people I know hate movies, right? Uh, some people hate going to the circus, even though I love it. My kids love the circus. Other people don't like the fair. I know that's sacrilege. But some people don't like it. They don't enjoy going and walking and, and doing all that stuff. Um, and then there are people who just, they're not sports people. 
They don't whatever. Um, and, and so the reality is even at those events, even though they're special, even though they're shared experiences, they're not for everybody. Now, that was just what I thought about when I... Just amazing. This is how kind of weird my brain is that I really thought this much about popcorn. All right? But then what I did is I took those four things, okay? And I started looking through Scripture. And there were four passages specifically that I really pulled out um, because I wanted to look and I thought if we are going to look at this idea, if we've been called the popcorn church, we need to find out if that is an actually an accurate description of who we are. If we are going to be those who portray, who are understood to be the, the popcorn Jesus, do we need to argue, with the, argue the case or do we need to be proudly wearing the moniker? And so when I went, I, the first place I went was Matthew. Went to Matthew 15. It starts with verse 29. It's a very short passage, but I was just I was interested to see how this works. With, um, so it says, Matthew 15, 29, Departing from there, Jesus went along the Sea of Galilee. Having gone up on the mountain, He was sitting there. Large crowds came to Him, bringing with them those who were lame, crippled, blind, mute, and many others. And they laid them down at His feet, and He healed them. So the crowd marveled as they saw the mute speaking, the crippled restored, and the lame walking and the blind seeing, and the glorified, the, the God of Israel. And Jesus called His disciples and said, I feel compassion for the people because they've remained with Me now three days and they have nothing to eat. And I don't want to send them away, for they might faint on the way. The disciples said to Him, Where will we get so many loaves in the desolate place to satisfy such a large crowd? And Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven and a few small fish. And He directed the people to sit down on the ground. And he took seven loaves and the fish, and giving, and giving thanks, he broke them and started giving them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. And the eight were satisfied, and they picked up what was left over of the broken pieces, seven large baskets full. And those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. And sending away the crowds, Jesus got into the boat and came to the region of Magadan. That's one session. Now what we're going to do, okay, and I realized today, as I was studying the sermon, um, like my English uh, comp class from you know, 20 years ago worked here because I gave my premise and now I'm giving all my examples and then I'm going to explain them later. Uh, the second session, one we, so hold that in your brain, okay? We know that story. Jesus, crowd of people, healing, feeding 4,000 people. It's not nearly, as, it's not usually as, as popular as the feeding of the 5,000, probably because four is less than five and people like the big numbers. Uh, but keep it in your brain, okay? The next one comes from Matthew. And it's actually, we've got two from Mark, I mean. When we had come to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together, so there was no longer room, not even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Being able to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus said, their faith said to the paralytic, seeing their faith said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak that way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way with themselves, said to him, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your son's sins are forgiven, or to get, say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet, went out in the sight of everyone, so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. We continue in Mark, going the next few verses, and he went out again by the seashore, all the people were coming to him, and he was teaching them. And he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me, and he got up and followed him. And it happened that he was reclining at the table in his house, and many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many of them, and they were following him. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why is he eating and drinking? with tax collectors and sinners. And hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. So those are three separate things from the Gospels. Now we're going to go to Acts. Acts 2. 
Okay, very common phrase. Usually when we talk about the act, we talk about even the idea of being an Acts 2 church. We focus on the end. Okay, but I want to I want to look at this the beginning of Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost has come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly they came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they prepared to them tongue, appeared to them tongues as a fire, distributing them, and they rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because of each of them was hearing them and speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia. Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, visited from Rome, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them in our own tongue speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexing, saying to one another, What does this mean? Four very different episodes, three from the life of Jesus, one from the very beginning of the church. Pentecost's. Pentecost. When I read these and a ton of other things, there were some things I, I noticed about this that really focused and, and redefined how I viewed this idea of being the popcorn church. The first thing that I noticed was that in each one of these things, something extremely special was going on. Okay? When Jesus was with a group of people, it, He was with crowds of people, He was feeding them, He was healing them, He was meeting their needs, He was teaching them in each one of those situations. With the Acts 2, I don't think it was, it was, it happened where it happened by accident, the day of Pentecost. It wasn't just because we needed a, a day that we could name it. It was like, oh, it's Pentecost, we're celebrating Pentecost. And so people will know for the next 2,000 years when this happened, we will call it Pentecost. They did it because there were groups of people there. There were already crowds of people gathered there who needed to hear the message. And I love it because it says, in Acts 2 it says, when they heard what was happening, they all came over to see. Now after that, we all know the story, Peter gives this huge message. Just, just breaks down the Gospel very clearly to this entire group of people. And they're hearing it in a bunch of different languages. All their own language. And it talks about how many people came to, to, the, to Jesus that day. But they came first because something was happening that was special. Right? And they came there, but, and it was if it had been one or two people in all of those situations, they wouldn't have, you know, it wouldn't have been nearly as, as big a deal. I mean, I, I know we, one person coming to follow Jesus is as important as thousands, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in the, in the framework of, of telling the story of Jesus and telling the story of Pentecost. That every time they're talking, it says there were crowds around Jesus. There were so many people you couldn't get into the house. People wanted to be there because something special was happening. So when I realized that, and I thought, oh, okay, well, people call it calls the popcorn church. That's cool with me, because something special is happening here. And people want to be here. That's great. We've got plenty of room. The other part of that that was really ex interesting was that, that, that it was a shared experience. I love the, the story that we read about the four men who brought their friend, and it's one of my favorite miracle stories of the Bible because Jesus really kind of sticks it to the the man a little bit, um, the Pharisaical man. Um, but he, you know, he's there, and these guys know Jesus can do something. And they know this, the, only, the only way that their, their friend is going to be healed is to get to Jesus. And so as a group, they go. And they make sure he gets there. It's a shared experience. I love the fact that all these stories from the Gospels, you know, the, the reason you've got four different versions is because you had Four different perspectives and some of the stuff is very similar and if you get into the studying the actual scripture you know a lot of it 
You know, there, there are parts of it that are shared, but there are also just unique elements in the Scripture because it was a shared experience. You had Jesus, you had His disciples, you had the other followers, and you had these massive crowds of people. And so when I saw that, I realized that to be called a popcorn Jesus church is actually a compliment. Now one of the things I also realized in these verses, and the reason we read so much of them, and I, I, real, I know that's a little bit different because a lot of times when we're doing, people do sermons, they'll do two or three verses and really focus on those, but I'm a storyteller. I like to get the whole story. And one of the things that, that I see in there is that there obviously, in each one of those situations, would have been, but in some of them very specifically, there are people saying, what is this? This is wrong. Jesus, you know, when Jesus is, forgives this guy's sins, and the first thing people say is, why is he forgiving those guys' sins? He doesn't have the authority to do that. And Jesus is like, yeah, dude, watch. Get up. Go home. And they go, okay, well. Now, did those guys become followers of Jesus? No, they were probably the same guys who tried to kill him a little bit later and succeeded, right? He see, he's hanging out with, with Levi and with the other tax collectors and all these people who everybody views as the sinners. And there's judgment on the outside saying, why is he hanging out with those guys? They're horrible people. And the first thing that blows my mind is that, they, that Jesus was attractive to the horrible people. I mean, I mean you realize, I mean, that's the thing that, that uh, just blows my mind sometimes is that you know, he, the people Jesus repelled the most were people who were extremely religious. The people who needed him, he attracted. And so he tells them, you know what, you don't need it. You've, already, you've decided you're, you're well. I'm going to go work with the people who need me because they're the ones who need a doctor. So it's not for everybody. And when I realized that, I was like, hey, that's us. <laughs> We're not for everybody. But neither was Jesus. Jesus is still not for everybody. You may be here this morning. It's the first time you've been in church ever. And you may have a, your own issue with Jesus. He's not for everybody. He offered Himself for everybody. He loves everybody. His forgiveness is for everybody. But He knows that everybody is not going to decide that He's for them. So when I was thinking about that in the framework, I'm like, okay, now we own this. We own this. We, own this. we are the popcorn church. We are the popcorn Jesus church, and it's a good thing. I started thinking about what's going on here at the church. And the first thing I wanted you guys to know is there are some special things happening here at Fellowship of Faith. Okay? People are going to continue every week to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's the most special thing. There are going to continue to be people who focus on helping others and showing care and love to other people. And this morning, I've actually asked uh, Nancy Blevins, our care team coach, to come up and talk a little bit. And she's actually said that she's going to bring her entire care team um, just so they can stand behind her and support her. It's like her posse, I guess. I don't know if she's going to throw down some beats or what. But, um, but she, I've asked her to come up and talk a little bit about kind of what's going on with, with uh, the boxes you see here. Um, talk a, a little bit more. I've got some other updates as far as care team stuff that I even heard. Uh, last night. So if Nancy and the rest of the team will come up, that would be great. You guys can give them a round of applause. She's a... They're coming. <laughs> Just so you guys know, some of you, if you've been here any length of time, you know this. Uh, this is not her favorite thing in the world to do. Actually, if this were, if there were a list of things that she would rather do other than speak, she would probably rather take a beating probably than be up here. But um, we're going to have her talk and um, oh yeah, get that thing. come on over here, ladies. In the middle, yeah. Okay, you're good. All right, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, what's happening with Operation Christmas Child? Um, you're, you know. 
Vanna's can do what they need to do, but um, all right, it's good. Okay. Um, this does fit right in with what Jamie was talking about. You're, yeah, right there. That's where right it goes. There? Yeah, that's where it goes. Have to stay still. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. Just needs to stay pointed at your face. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next few weeks, we're going to be uh, promoting Operation Christmas Child, the Shoebox Ministry of Samaritan Church. Um, our goal this year is to fill 200 shoeboxes, and um, we've got a little different approach uh, to the committee the other night, deciding that we would use the ticket system. That kind of goes along with the pop quiz. Yeah, it does tickets. You're right. It's perfect. We could be called the ticket church. She's, now she's a comedian. <laughs> so Paul is going to explain about uh, she and Amy about the ticket uh, approach to the Operation Christmas. Amy's going to do it? No, Paul is going to do it. Oh, okay. Amy is on vacation. I was going to say, she's not even here. <laughs> well, I sure isn't here. Thought maybe she videotaped Tracy it. isn't here. They're the rest of the team. Okay, we've had a lot of success here at our church. You guys have been awesome with the ticket program for the snack packs and also the uh, care mail, which there are some updates, some quotes from all our college people out there, too. Um, so we have a box of that. The price of the each ticket is about $10, right around $10. And they have items on them that Leslie will show you as I talk here. Um, Amy was able to, she's our magnificent ticket maker, shopper, person, lady. She, uh, she got all of this stuff in this bag that Leslie's going to show you for $14. And that can fill right around, the stuff will be divided between three of the boxes. So that's that. And then we also have a box of, because we'll need to put shipping money in these. So we have the box that has the dollar sign on it. Each ticket is $10. So those of you who just want to hand money, some of you like to do that. You don't like to go shopping or whatever. You're welcome to do that, and that'll help us cover the shipping cost of all these 200 boxes. So. Okay. Thank you. Are you finished? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Oh, okay. one method of uh, <laughs> filling the shoe boxes. Uh, the other, if you choose to fill your own box, you can pick up one of the shoe boxes out by the door as you go out. Um, we ask that if, 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 if you choose to fill your own shoe box, please follow carefully the instructions in this flyer that's in your program today. It tells you what not to put in them and what you can put in them. Um, we would ask that uh, you can use this type of shoe box. You can use a plastic box. You can use a covered shoe box. If you choose to cover your own shoe box, cover the lid separately because at the, at the uh, packing center, those have to be open and inspected. And uh, you can do whatever method you choose uh, by helping us fill up these or doing one yourself. Um, as the video showed you in the beginning, last year they reached the 100 million shoe boxes. Um, and so they're hoping to be a part of that. And these little boxes are called go boxes, which means gospel opportunity. And along with what Jamie's saying, this is how we can spread the good news of Jesus Christ to children all over the world. Um, our kids are in here in kids' faith, learning about Jesus today. All over the world, that's not happening. There are so many children that don't have that opportunity. And this is one way that we can reach them. Uh, at the packing place in North Carolina, there is a brochure that goes in each box that, that has the gospel of Jesus Christ in the language of the child that's receiving that box. So uh, we have that chance to spread the word and we have the chance of serving Jesus Christ by filling the boxes. All right. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much, ladies. You need to clap again. <laughs> Just hit the mute button. All right. Oh, yeah, they'll be outside. Um, so you can look for the, the green and red box afterwards to, if you want to participate in that. Um, which, like I said, they're trying, they're trying something new. They said that they're trying something new with it to try to figure out what's going on. 
The goal is, like I said, like they said, 200 boxes. One of the things that Nancy didn't mention, but I'm sure she would she would want me to mention because I know it was something that changed from last year. Um, with these boxes, they really want you to stay with standard size shoe boxes. Okay, that's why all these were the same size, about this 